Today's Friday and that means F&A Friday, but today it's not going to be about tips and tricks. Today I'm gonna to answer the questions that you asked last week. All right, so let me oh, get closer to my monitor and I'm gonna scoot over this way. So I'm gonna display the questions full screen and then leave them here-ish so that, um, you know, as I'm rattling on that you can still kind of cross-reference with the questions for anybody that kind of scrubs through the clips. So some of the questions I'm gonna answer completely, some of them I'm gonna keep for future FNAs and other uploads or video type of things. And if you have other questions after all this, feel free to comment and I might do another Q&A in the future, maybe once a month, maybe every two months. I think there were a lot of really good questions and a ton, a ton of material for me to do. So that was great. So let's start. All right. And it's going to be the the time, the big butchering of names. So I apologize in advance. Um, I'm already scared. I'm going to try. So bear with me. So Dian, Dianara Banania, Banania, Banania um, asks, hi, Jean. By the way, uh, it's, uh, it's Jean Denis or JD. Like Jean Dennis, the hyphen combines both Jean and Dennis. So it's Jean Denis or JD, but it's not Jean. I'm just throwing it out there. And this is not for this is everybody. It's I can be with someone on the phone and they ask me, what's your first name? And I go, Jean Denis. And they say, oh, hi, Jean. <laughs> okay, well, let's do this. Do you have any tips regarding shooting references? Do you shoot it before or after planning? How do you personally utilize references? And how have you seen other animators utilize it? Um, oh, let's see. So regarding the tips for shooting reference, uh, I did a clip about reference preparation, but the main thing would be definitely create your space so that it resembles as closely as you can uh, to the shot that you want to do. If you shoot reference and the angle is different and the props that you're using or no props or the, whatever the costumes or or like where you look, the eyeliner, if all of that is different, then at the end, it doesn't quite help. You can still use it. You can use it for body movement, just in general observation of how does my body move, might not be from this angle, might not be for, you know, specifically replicating it for the shot, but it might still be something that you can think about, okay, this is how I turn my head, this is how I move my shoulder. So general body observation, um, that can still work. But in general, tips wise, I would say just make it as close as you can, um, just because it kind of eliminates steps in the middle. You can, not that you want to copy it, unless you have to, depending on the medium or the style. Um, but it just kind of helps, and especially for me, it's eyeliner, so like on camera angles. Uh, do you shoot it before or after planning? I shoot it all the time. Um, so I shoot the general reference at the beginning, and then as I continue with the shot, I might have a different idea, and I need to change something, and then I feel that, well, I need to do something new, and I haven't quite ca captured that yet, and then I shoot new reference. Or I shoot reference once I'm done with whatever the shot would look like, I would do a mouth pass or an eye pass or, you know, a specific gesture on the arm or finger stuff. I can shoot separate pieces of reference for different angles, different body parts. Um, and that, that will be till the very end. So I'm not really, it doesn't have to be the very beginning and then you're done. So you can do whatever you want. Um, how do you personally utilize references and how have you seen other animators utilize it? Um, so yeah, so that's how I use it. And the range is, you know, it just, it's a huge range where people use it loosely and then embellish on that and then are really good at tweaking the pose and making it fit for that style. Other people um, are really good at shooting reference and it's energetic and stylized and the timing is already great and there's some minimal tweaking. There's always, still, you shoot a couple takes, either shoot 10, 20, 20, 30 takes and then you just copy paste and make one master take. Um, but within that, it might already be really, really far along that it needs minimal tweaking. Uh, for me, and this is going to be for future thing, but I might as well mention it now, like one of the super time saving ways of using reference. And I know I'm saying rotoscoping and it's also f only for visual effects. I, I use it kind of for cartoony stuff when I do stuff at home as well, but it's basically I shoot reference and then I take that reference, you know, you take shoot multiple takes, do the copy paste and your master take, but I take that whole thing into Maya as a background. And then every four frames, I copy my reference. So if it's live action and it needs to be a stunt double, then that's fine because it's gonna look real and you're gonna still have to tweak it because you can't quite copy one-to-one. -one. It still needs some tweaks here and there and timing pushing and stuff like that. Um, but even for cartoony stuff, not that I use it, I end up using, you know, like a head turn or a certain moment. So like 80% probably goes out. But what I like about that approach is that 
I can shoot reference, put that into Maya, and then within a couple minutes, you just copy, 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 basically, rotoscope basically, right? loosely on every four frames. For me, for at least at work, I also see, does my acting and my movement, my gestures, maybe if I take a couple steps, does that work with the camera move, if we're shooting with a plate, um, is there any plate interaction? Am I shooting opposite another creature or a human in a, in a plate? Um, so I can see if my ideas will actually work within that scene and that environment and the timing of it. And also the scale, a lot of times you shoot reference and then your rig is, is different. Like it's a, I'd say it's a creature, but it could just be a different design. It doesn't have to be superhuman. Um, so then you can see, well, maybe my proportions are not right or it's a good beginning, but now I need to embellish and change that and so on and so on. So to me, it's a really, really fast way to block things out very roughly, take the essence of it, tweak it, see if it's going to work in terms of timing, when things happen, the plate, the camera and so on. And then I can tweak it and then I can shoot more reference, do different takes. Then you can shoot a lot of different takes very quickly, block this out very quickly for a very rough presentation of ideas. It's basically for ideas for your lead or soup. And then they can say, I like this, this, and then maybe go with this one. And then you can always embellish and continue and, and tweak and finalize that or reshoot reference because you know what you really want and then be more specific about certain things. So that's, that's kind of my approach. So uh, Henry Soren, that was forgiving that name. How do you record reference for things that are physically impossible or hard to replicate? Good question too. So when they're physically impossible, hard to replicate, I can't. Um, I might take the essence of it if it's a specific thing, but if it's a specific creature and I need to do like or something, you know, it's not gonna work. If I, if I shoot reference for being a gorilla, it's not gonna quite work, you know, it's whatever. Whatever you think you can do, it's, the, the anatomy is different, right? The way is different. There's so much that's gonna be different. So then I look online, I check, footage, uh, nature footage, go on YouTube or ask someone else if they have footage. There's a lot of stuff you can find online. And then I start picking things um, that will work better. And sometimes if it's a fantasy creature that has zero reference, this looks totally different. I try to base the movement on something that exists in this world. You know, if it's a flying creature, what kind of flying bird or whatever could I use or just elements of it and put that into the shot and into the creature so that when the audience watches that shot, they go, maybe subconsciously, they might not go out loud, but maybe subconsciously they go, yeah, I, I have seen this before. I'm familiar with this move. I don't know what it is, but I buy it. And now I buy the performance. If it's completely alien and every move is totally weird, there's a bigger disconnect, unless that's the complete point of it and to make it really super weird. Um, but yeah, so for things that are physically impossible, uh, I just have to look elsewhere. And if all that fails, you just got to make it up. A lot of times I just make it up. I don't shoot reference for everything. Sometimes you already have a clear idea. To me, reference is very helpful. But if you have reference and you have zero idea what you want to do, you only get so far. You start copying the reference and then it's going to be kind of stiff and lifeless. And eh, there's not, I don't know, there's something maybe missing. And then you're stuck. So I like to start any shot with a great, not a great idea. It's very they don't always, they're not great, but with a uh, clear, that's what I meant, with a clear image. So I visualize, because I can't draw thumbnails. I'm horrible at drawing. I love drawing, but I, I can't. So I try to see it in my head uh, clearly, as clear as I can. And I go, okay, well, that's what I want to do. Let's go. And then I can um, collect material that will support me in getting to that vision. But without a plan, without knowing exactly what you want, I'm just going to waste time. So before I do any of this, I want to know what I want to what I want to do, right? Um, Arthur, Arthur, Juan, Juan. Sorry again. This is one of those. I, I, I don't know. Um, hey JD, it would be cool if you could talk about hiring animators from abroad. Is it a difficult process to go to the U.S.? What company can provide to animators from abroad, etc.? And always thanks for the uh, positive feedback there. Uh, that's a tricky one because I am not part of HR. I'm not familiar with the process. And when I got hired, that was 15 years ago, that was different. My H1B was for four years. Then I needed to apply for another H1B. And um, it's just different different things that, uh, that were needed. Um, so I don't know. So my honest answer is I don't know. All I would say is look at the visa requirements of the country you're applying to. Two, is that English? 
Um, so for me, coming from Switzerland to the States, to get an H1B, I needed a bachelor degree. So that's why I went to the Academy uh, of Art. So I needed a degree, either master's or bachelor, it, just to qualify for the H1B. So that was my plan, um, you know. And back then, Mentor and I Animate and, you know, Adam School, all that didn't exist. So it was kind of a brick and mortar thing to learn animation and online was not really the thing yet. Um, so that was my plan. So difficult process to go to the US. Also probably given the today's politics, um, depends where you're from. Um, issuing a visa might be a problem. Um, but technically what company can provide, I mean, every company is going to go through a process of applying for the, the work visa and then it costs money. So I don't know, it is really tricky. So if they're in a time crunch, they might take someone that already has all the, you know, they're, they're, um, they don't need all that paperwork and the work permits. So even though both animators might be equally good in terms of this, the showreel, maybe you know they need someone right now so they can't go through the process of the visa uh, process and then it takes someone else so i don't know there's a lot of different factors you might be the greatest in the world but if there's no visa and there's no money for it and there's a time crunch um that's kind of a it's kind of a problem so i don't know i don't know if this is helpful um you can always if there's a way if the company has contact information ask the company um you know i'm from this and this place what can i do well what what can you do? How can you help me? And how can I help you to facilitate that process? Um, and then reach out, you know, like some companies have HR people on Twitter, um, probably also Facebook, but I, I follow a couple of them on Twitter and you can always ask there, you know, they're always kind of their ways. And maybe if you know someone at, the, at that specific company, you can ask that animator, whoever, you know, person you know there, if you're talking about animation, um, and then they can potentially ask HR internally and then they might give them information and they give it back to you. So a couple ways, but I'm not sure if that was helpful. Uh, Bijay Pande, Pande, sorry, Bijay, Bijay, sorry. Um, another question, if you don't mind, not at all, is there any hope for aspiring animators like me who don't want to work on sequels and or PG films, more violence and nudity maybe, and deeper, darker stories and characters? Um, there's always hope, yes. Simply anti-Disney, if I may. Do you think films are going to be mainstream anytime soon? So you mean darker films, but they're pretty mainstream already, uh, the 3D feature films. Or is the future still going to give us more films that look um, cute and have family-friendly stories? So you're, you're, you're answering that there. Um, no hate for the films out there right now. They have my respect and admiration, blah, 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 blah. Not rude at all. No, this is totally valid. And I'm in the same camp. The thing is, I... I love movies, I love the stories, and I love different type of things. I can go watch Pretty Woman, and I have a great time, and then I can watch The Road, and it's <laughs> depressing and horrible, and I also have a great time. Um, and then I can watch The Incredibles 2 and still have a good time. You know what I mean? Like there's, there, I think there is hope for sure. The problem is that they cost a lot of money, those movies. So you gotta produce something, I mean, I say unfortunately, quotation marks, but you need to get your money back. So if you're doing an animated feature that costs a ton of money, that uh, is just really dark and you know has this very small audience, I'm thinking, for instance, like Dark City. I love that movie. That movie as an animated feature, release it now, I'm not sure how much, movie it would make, uh, how much money it would make, but it would still cost a lot to do. Um, so I don't know, you know, it's just, it's a tricky thing. You can do those films, but you got to get the money back. If you don't get the money back, who's going to invest in that money unless you have the money, right? Um, and there are some that come out, like Next Gen is going to come out soon on Netflix, actually in a week, I think, that I'm not sure the budget, I think online they said something about 30 million. That's pretty cheap. That's on the low side. I think maybe the lowest, I don't know. I'm not super familiar, but that seems to be kind of the lower side, but you know, like sausage party was low but then i think the reported budget was different uh, or yeah that was different than what it actually cost shenanigans with financials um so I, I totally understand and there there are some movies uh that would be great in cg it doesn't have to be i'm not in the camp that is if you can shoot it real then make it a live action movie uh, uh, no um for me it's if it's a cool story and you just want to show it animated then why not it doesn't have to be something that you can't do with live action. I understand why, why you would, um, but I don't, I'm not in that camp. So I'm, you can look at anime. They, they have a ton of great movies where 
you know, it's not the cutesy type of thing. So, so long, long answer. I say, yes, there's hope. It's just tricky. The tricky thing is the financials. Who's going to invest in this and how are they going to get the money back? That's always kind of, it's always a business, right? Uh, Lee Cook. Hi, Gene. It's not Gene. Thank you so much for uploading these videos. You're very, very welcome. Um, I think I answered this already because you only have a few uh, weeks left, but I'm going to read it uh, because I might actually take this whole thing and just copy it, rip it for the podcast instead of re-recording something. Uh, And I'm still fixing the podcast issues, but it's going to relaunch. Um, So let me just reading it. Uh, Thank you so much for uploading these videos. They're helping me out quite a bit. I have seven months left of animation school. And my question is, when you're preparing a character animation demo reel, would you suggest medium shots or full shots just so you can get a better read on how well the animator can use body dynamics or just put a body dynamic shot in the reel alongside with medium shots? Are you going to do any videos regarding curve cleanup? Two questions there. Uh, So yes, yes, and yes. So... Basically, for your reel, um, medium shots are totally fine. The thing is, you have to look at your reel in terms of each shot is going to display another skill set. So let's pretend you're really good at facial stuff and all you have um, on your reel are close-ups. Then I watch his reel and I go, that's cool. You're really good at this. And if you need someone for this product that does exactly that, that's great. But I don't know. I don't see the body. Can you do weights, walks, you know, weight shifts and just interaction? There's, there's more stuff with the body you can do. So to me, it would be you want to hit the full body mechanics for sure in your reel. You got to show that I can do a full body and the weight is there and the mechanics are there and everything's great. Uh, weight and you can combine that, you know, not to have to weight lift, but, you know, whatever I show with how to take your shot, you know, and expand on this. So you can, you definitely want to, show the whole body, then you can show pantomime medium, also pantomime full body, full body acting, Mr. Bean style is also important. And then you can go into medium shots if you do acting and facial performance stuff. And then I would do multiples where you you cover a range of emotions from whatever you wanna do, right? Super sad, super happy, but you wanna, you wanna do multiple things. So to me, a reel shows variety. Um, be mindful of the style. So maybe a variety in style might not be super helpful if the company you're applying for or two, uh, has a very specific style. So if you do something that's super snappy, but the company doesn't do that, um, you know, you have one shot that matches their style, that might be a problem. So A, research what the company is and their style, and then look at what you can do for that. Uh, but in terms of dynamics, uh, body dynamics and uh, medium shots and everything, yes, in terms of, yes, medium shots, but yes, full shots. I, I would show everything, right? Because you want to cover all that. And then don't forget also in terms of the humans, you want to do uh, female, male, creatures, um, younglings, kids, right? But f- creature young and, and human young and big and small and skinny. Like there's just, there's so much variety uh, in rigs. Uh, and I know it's tricky to find the right rig that would work, you know, if, for whatever you want to do. But try to have not just variety in cameras and then body actions, how much you can see but the content and the type of character and the scale and the creatures um, that perform that action. And just because I say creature, it doesn't have to be for real. You know I mean? You can think of how to train a dragon or whatever creature thing, Rio or the Zootopia, whatever you have nowadays, even the pig and Moana, there's so many things you can do with creatures that, that don't have to be for real, right? So you can still do something cartoony. Like I love Ratatouille where just in general, I love it. But uh, but you have the creature movement and get up and then they act and they go back to creature movement. So you can go back and forth. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, are you going to do any videos regarding curve cleanup? Um, I was not going to as of yet, but uh, yes, I can definitely touch upon it. Um, because I'm not, yes, to, to me, is the curve cleanup is a process that is for me in the blocking stage in terms of keeping things simple and clean so you can do changes, you make changes in your shot quickly for feedback, you know, from the leads and soups to present to the client faster. Um, I'm not hugely into cleaning up curves once you're done or even towards the end. It was towards the end, like I might do post to pose or layer and at the end it's just every control and a messy in every frame and constraints and there's all kinds of stuff. So it looks good, <laughs> hopefully. And then when it's approved, like I don't touch this anymore. Like I don't care. I don't. I'm. I'm never touching anything once it's done. The only time I touch things is if I'm going to be off the show 
um, or off the shot, and I know someone else is going to come in, then I save out a separate scene if I have time. It doesn't always uh, happen like that, uh, where I bake out curves, um, constraints, right? And I name everything correctly so that whoever picks this up goes, oh yeah, I can start from scratch and I can I can do my own thing. But if you get a, a scene from someone else and you got constraints and weighted tangents, I'm not a fan of weighted tangents or animation layers, it's just, it, it, get, it takes time to get into the that workflow. And that's a, it's a waste of time, but I like to be efficient. So it's I'm not a massive fan of getting these type of scenes. Um, so cleanup is more at the beginning and towards the end, I don't really care. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna do a separate long FNA just about cleanup, but I'm definitely gonna incorporate it to something else, if that makes sense. Hope that helps. All right, Giuseppe S. Awesome, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't wait to see you share your next 10,000, 100,000. We'll see about that one. If that rate continues, I might hit 5,000 in a year. It'd be awesome to hit 10,000 in a year. Why not? To cover the 10K, I don't know. I don't have that much questions since you covered most of them and I'm sure other will ask the best questions possible, but I would like to ask a few non-related questions, maybe for future videos. One, you, you to your top three favorite chocolates and snacks. That's a good question. Root of sport. Love that. Um, I should have researched that one. Uh, there's some other ones. Not to say Nestle, but there's some Swiss chocolate that was really, really good. Snacks. I like chips. Um, we have those uh, crepes and crepe with the chocolate in it. There's sometimes some crispy nuts in there that you can reheat in a pan or whatever microwave that my six-year-old loves. And I like those actually a lot just recently. I love chocolate covered macadamias. Um, those are great. Uh, I don't know, like, there's so many chocolates. I need to research that and maybe I'll do a food related uh, thing. Uh, snacks, yeah, that's kind of, read a sport, it's kind of my default. I just always like that. If you're out there, I mean, I like Snickers, like M&Ms, all that crap that you shouldn't eat, it's not good for you. But read a sport, still like that. Two, what do you like to do while not animating? Um, well, I do a lot that's related to animation for sure, right? So I watch a ton of movies and I love it. I'll watch a ton of TV shows. Uh, I would love to play more video games. Uh, it's hard to find the time because I want to spend the time on the movies and TV shows because A, I like it. It also helps me with work and I can put this stuff online as well. It helps for my classes. Um, but anything that evolves around that. Uh, I used to read a lot of comic books and that also kind of stopped. Um, heavily into video games until until work and kids. So it's a bit tricky, but now I'm playing a ton of Mario Kart and Kirby and Nintendo Labo. Um, what else are we playing? It's with my six year old, like every night we play like 10, 20, 15 minutes, whatever uh, time we have. So I play stuff that he plays, but uh, someone just, um, I, I borrowed God of War, the new one, never started. I bore, sorry, Andy, I borrowed uh, Alien Isolation for like three, four years. And uh, Jair, I, I really apologize. I think I have order 80, 1886, I think that's the one. I think it's been three years, four, oh, four years. Never even put it in, it's horrible. I have classic Xbox or PlayStation 1 games still wrapped, like Prince of Persia, the old one. But anyway, so I used to play a ton, um, but anyway. Uh, apart from that, um, whatever free time I have, I just like to spend time with my family. Um, you know, snuggling with my wife, going places, Disneyland. Uh, go out outside, you know, stroll in the city here in Petaluma. Um, when I have time, I like to exercise. Um, I started again, more heavy exercises. I'm getting, I'm getting a bit too much weight and I sit all the time. So, but I like physical activities. I like to play tennis a lot. I like to play basketball, get a hoop outside. Um, so it's a lot of sports, family and entertainment. I think that's probably the biggest thing. I do play probably more VR than, um, than console TV games. Um, what else? I think that's kind of it. And whatever comes around, I got a ton of books. You know, if I have time to read. Um, what else would I do? I'm looking around. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't have that much time with work and all the stuff that I do. So whatever time I have, it's usually just family related time. Um, and that could be anything, right? You can go out to like the train park or something, my little one or... Um, you know, go to movies with my older one. So like he's, you know, he's older, so he has his own interests there. Um, so that's kind of it. I try to, I swim a lot too. The summer, I, just, I would say sports, like being fit, not die too soon. Uh, I, I eat a lot. Actually, when I know animate, I eat a lot. It's also a problem. Uh, family time and just stuff, 
you know, movies and games and stuff like that. Uh, I don't play any instruments. I used to play piano. Uh, but when I never practiced, I'm horrible at it. Um, I don't even know anything about that anymore. Um, so yeah, I should probably say something else just to pretend that I'm doing more varied stuff. But you know, like I don't paint. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. That's that's kind of it. Uh, what's your advice for someone who is about to start learning 3D? Render, modeling, animate, whatever. Uh, that's it for now. What's your for someone who's about to start learning 3D? Good question. Well, it depends. I mean, render, modeling, animate, whatever. You have to look at, it's hard. I mean, if you're just starting, I don't know if you have a long-term plan. I would look at, well, if you're doing rendering, what's the modeling? Well, what's what do you want to do in five years? What do you want to do in 10 years? Is that something you want to do on your own as a hobby? Uh, is it something you have business you want to start or something where you want to work for a company? And any of these, where is, is that going to be in the city where you're at? Is there any other city? You have to move out and then go to a different country. That would look long-term in terms of, well, if I want to do this, what does that mean? What's that, that trajectory and, and looking to the future, where would I end up? And then you can look at, well, if I want to go there in five years and city and company and all that, that comes with that. Um, what do I need to do to get there? So, you know, maybe learning the language and then other things. And there's just a lot of stuff that's involved uh, in terms of software. Again, if it's a hobby, you can, I guess, whatever use whatever you have at your disposal, free or not free, depending on your financial situation. But if it's for a company, look at, well, you know, if you want to do bigger companies, a lot of companies use Maya for animation. So I would probably look at Maya to practice that to then, you know, be a good asset for a company because you don't have to retrain you. You know what I mean? So I would kind of look in that area if that's helpful. Um, and for learning 3D, the other thing I would do is obviously not stick to that um, specific area, if that makes sense. So if, you know, like for me, like animation, I don't, I don't just look at animation movies, anime, uh, you know, like animated TV shows or animated movies. I look at acting in general or creatures in general, look at nature movies or reference um, books for how to, how they're like anatomy or, um, you know, anything where you can go to the zoo. Like and you try to involve the outside part of that field of interest, if that makes sense. So I, I'm not stuck just purely with animation. I look at, well, what goes around that? And then for me, it's also sound design. Like I love sound design. If I wouldn't do uh, animation, it would be sound design. So when I animate, I also think in terms of, well, I can do all the rah, rah, rah creature or whatever movement you have for me at work. Um, but then you have to look at, well, how does that work within the sequence? Are there any actors around it? Are actors talking maybe? If you have a creature in the background or is that, you know, there's a lot of sound if you have a rough cut um, within the sequence is, does your, do your actions basically, uh, is there too much? If you, if your creature always goes rah, 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 and someone has to put in that roar, is that going to overshadow, um, no over sound, if that's a term, uh, the other creature, the other human or whatever it is that's in that scene. You know what I mean? The creature, the, the actions that you have, someone's going to add sound to that. So you want a good rhythm to it, but you also don't want the sounds to take up too much real estate uh, in, a, in an audio sense, if, if that makes sense, right? So if I, I remember animating a creature way, way back in episode three, um, like it'll just drag anything that Obi-Wan writes. But then Obi-Wan is talking to one of those red guys and um, I don't remember their names, I should. It's that silo planet thing where they go down, I actually animated that ship too. But anyway, um, so I can't have the creature constantly going ah, 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 in the back because I mean they could also just not put in the sound, but it would just be very distracting. And cut. This is the end of part one because I'm an idiot and I forgot that this camera has a 30 minute maximum recording time. I recorded at a timer one hour 47 and it stopped after 29 minutes. I'm so sad, but I'm an idiot. That's how I should have researched it. So this is now part one and I will continue next week with part two. Maybe I can figure it out how to make this work. I can just record it on the computer and not through the camera. So it's one longer thing. So maybe just two parts, but this is it for now. If you watch the whole thing, as always, thank you so much. I appreciate it. If there was anything in there that was not clear or you got more questions about it, let me know. More questions can come. I can combine them and add them and do another one, another Q&A. So any comments, let me know. 
Uh, as always, subscribe if you haven't yet. I would love it if you do. It helps me. And uh, I said the whole thing at the end of the previous one I didn't record, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next week for part two if you want to see part two of this Q&A. Other than that, we'll see you Monday. Thank you.